Right, ladies and gentlemen, something a little bit different for you today in this uh, in this little episode. Basically, if you are a fan of engineering, in particular a fan of engines, and even more in particular if you are a fan of Rolls-Royce V12 engines, then this is the episode for you. So, to give you a bit of a flavour of what's coming up, I'm going to introduce you to these two fellas, which you've seen before in other videos. So. This is Alex Sharphouse, the madman from Cumbria who did that massive steam convoy uh, through the Lake District. So if you haven't seen that video, go and have a look at that. This is obviously, it's Mr Kev Whittingham, the legendary tractor puller from the northwest of England who was heavily featured in our behind the scenes uh, series of the Great Eccleston Tractor Pull Weekend. So gents, we're here, well we're in Kev's workshop today and we've got this Rolls Royce V12 Griffin engine. So we're going to tell you a little bit of the story about this engine, what it's doing, the things we've had to do to it, and basically where it's going to end up. So Alex, we'll start with you, because this is one of your, just another one of your okay. mad ideas. Mad so ideas. go on, hit me with it. What are you up to with this engine? What am I up to? So obviously you've followed us with Talisman, the building of it, the using it and everything there. So when it was finished, it was six years of pain. Um, a lot of work, divorce papers were virtually signed. Right, it got to that it, point, did it? It, it, it was getting there. Um, <laughs> so the final finish, sit down, everyone, what are you going to do next? Well, for a week, I said nothing, and then kind of had an idea that I wanted to do something totally different, but um, again, showcasing British history. I kind of always had a fascination for the old boys who did the speed attempts and that kind of hellfire, dangerous kind of things. And we've done steam engines going slow but pulling heavy weights. So now I thought I'll do something that goes fast and lightweight. And you know, what a good way to go, getting that sort of age. <laughs> So I was looking at. Is this your crisis period? I think so. You know, yeah, it's one of three. I think you have. I don't, know, right. I don't know what. The, I'm not sure. We'll get to that, won't we? Right. Yeah. So this is the second one. Um, so I was looking at, you know, what if you're going to put an aero engine in, into a vehicle, it has as to be do. as you do. It has to be, you know, a Rolls Royce, doesn't it? V12. It's got to be there. British history. We none of us would be studying here today if it wasn't for the history of these exactly. machines. What they did. What they stand for. So that, for me, is massive. And then, you know, having one of these engines and doing one up or whatever is one thing, but just firing it up and standing around, it doesn't just do it for me. You've got to be able to use it. And the actual going flying thing, I'm a bit scared of heights and that sort of stuff. So, so flying was ruled Flying out. was ruled out, yeah. Um, so I had to go into a vehicle. So I thought, really, what else to do? Put it into a period car, speed attempt, kind of mad thing, which is what happened in, in the day, in the 30s, 40s, if you wanted to go fast and break a record, you took the biggest engine that you could buy, which was an aero engine, and you found the biggest car chassis that you could find, and you put the two together, and in your shed, that's what you made. And that's what I've decided to try and do, not using any form of modern technology. It's got to be, as it would have been, 30s, 40s, if you were part of the Campbell family who were famous from our area for like the Bluebird speed attempts and stuff, this is how you'd have done it and that, that's what we're trying to do. Well, before we get stuck into the technical challenges, let's move over to Kev. Can just talk us through your history of the, you know, using these Griffin engines? Because obviously we've seen you at the tracks pulls. Yeah, yeah. We've, uh, we've... Just talk us where it started for you, your story with these engines. Well, we, I started in 1979, quite a while ago, and uh, we progressed through different engine combinations, and eventually, about 1990, we, we got converted onto Griffins. And, and what's, for you, what's the appeal of this engine? Oh, it's, it's, people love the Merlin, but once you've had a Griffin or heard a Griffin, mm. it, it, it's a different, it's a different animal. It's yeah. a different firing order than the Merlin. It just has a different tone. You know, it's, it's, it's the Formula One engine of its day. Yeah. You know, it's got the best of the best in. Right, yeah. so back in its day, what would this have... Obviously it have been in planes, but which planes would it have been in? Well, this, this is a Griffin, but there was different marks of Griffin. Right. Like there was different marks of Merlins. Yeah. These are 58s. This was particular mark was in the Shackleton. But there was earlier Griffins that were in Spitfires. Um, and even marine-based engines that were in motor torpedo right. boats. So it was the, the last piston engine before they went to jets. Yeah. You know, it was... This is the glory of this, this, this is This is the peak, I think. Right, so yeah. you say this is, this is a 58, this? Yeah, Mark 58. Mark 58. 
Is this kind of similar to what you use on Snoopy same, 3 and 4? Same, same. Same, same engine, yeah. is it? Right. Yeah. And what sort of, uh, what, well, what capacity are these engines? 36.7 litre. Right. So yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's, it's back to displacement. There's no, <laughs> no replacement for displacement. Absolutely. So. And the horsepower that you guys make, just remind everybody, if you haven't seen that we, behind the scenes video that they tried to pull. We, we run the Avgas tractor with, with 3,000 plus horsepower per engine, so that's 6,000 plus yeah. on the tractor. And then the alcohol tractor, we're looking at 8,000 plus. Right. Know. So <laughs> going back to this, what what state was it in and what have you had to do so far to this engine? So obviously the delight of getting it was, was one thing, so then you start scratching and you think, well how hard can this be? And then it <laughs> become quite apparent, quite difficult, very, really. very <laughs> difficult. So knowing nothing about the particular engine, obviously, you know, good mechanical knowledge and many engines before, where, where, where do you go and what do you do with it? And it, and it was in a, a pretty sorry state. It was, you know, seized up, battered up, and just been sat outside for a number of years. Um, so, luckily, that's what, why we're here today. I became aware of uh, Kevin, spoke to Kevin about it, and he's been absolutely fabulous. Oh, no, definitely wouldn't have been here with it now if I hadn't spoke to him for his knowledge, advice, patience, and, uh, and, and supply of numerous bits and pieces that we needed. The, the one thing that you said to me, wasn't it really, don't be under any illusion that you're going to unseize this and fire it up like you might do with some old digger. Like just, so anyway, it stripped it all to bits and then because obviously we're not putting it in an aeroplane, we need to alter it significantly to fit my application as Kevin does with his tractors. Mm. We don't want to propeller shaft for a, you know, a prop on it, which they were counter-rotating props, so you've got two propellers spinning in the opposite direction at half the speed of the crank and all the rest of it. So, we needed to basically, we want shaft speed, a flywheel on the end, a clutch, and, and a transmission standard yeah. to a, a thing. So, again, off Kevin's information and his knowledge and trial and error, the first thing that you got to alter from the bare block is the how it's fed with oil because the crank's fed up the ends of it to get its oil to its journals. Well, right. you can't feed the crank up the end if you're putting a flywheel on the end of it and all that. So when it's down to an absolute bare block, we drilled new oil ways. So is that what we can see? That's on, what we can on see in one? there. And on, on, on here you can see all this uh, manifold and so if this is all non-standard um, pipe work to feed it. So your oil, your oil pumps in the sump and it feeds independently up to, there's a filter on here, a manifold, and then pipes to the different galleries, giving it extra oil up to the, the cams and feeding all the journals. So this is my own take on how to do it, kind of purely with Kevin's advice and guidance on this is what to do. Yeah. Um, and then at the back end of it, we obviously on here, there would have been a, a you know, your, your prop shaft for your propellers would have been up, sticking out up here with a, a box on there. And behind that, you've got gears that drive your cams and your, you know, all your other ancillaries in there. You might, so we mocked up a kind of a bell housing which is that's to, to fit now a gearbox that we've got to go on it as ZF box and a flywheel and, and a standard wagon clutch is what we're going to attempt to use this might all not work but we're just <laughs> working progress, work in progress you know trial error so we mocked up an aluminium kind of dummy one which all fitted and worked and and, and come up with that that's the idea and then I took it to um, a friend of mine who's complete engineering up at Carlisle fantastic uh, guy up there who's very passionate about these things as well and he drew it all up and cnc this uh, thing of beauty out of aluminium and, and that's on there and, and up to now that that's kind of work and our next stage from here once we've done what we're doing today with it is to gearbox on it and and start fitting it in the the car chassis that we've that we've got but yeah if you're on about i'm gonna say let's have a look at this the, one. the stuff looking like mm. uh, well, this is one of this is one of your. What, what's this, Ken? This is one of your. Yeah, this is one of the tractor it? engines that were in rebuilt. So we we drill all the the seven main caps and feed the oil in. Where where as Alex says, they're either fed end to end. End to end. So right. the front end can still stay stay original, but we can't use the rear supply. So yeah. then we just put the seven in, and we're looking for more performance. So we want more oil to all the bearings. Because the centre bearing is one that's always going to suffer mm. when you're feeding it end to end, because it gets the oil last. So we want to make sure that centre bearing gets lots of oil. One of, one of the problems is they don't rev particularly hard. I mean, we've sort of done our calculations at them running at um, two and a half thousand, but they'd like two seven fifty was what they were rated at. They would rev to more 
in a plane, but they were meant to be rebuilt if they were in anger, rev to like three one. But me and you rev them till yeah, till something yeah. happens. Yeah, um, as, if some, <laughs> as, if, as if we're being chased. I've gone for a manual box just because I don't like automatic transmission. It isn't the right era for what we're trying to achieve. So we looked at the Rolls box I've got out the car. A beautiful thing. Looked inside it and thought, oh dear, that's not going to, that's not having it. Um, yeah, we're going to have a whole lot of bits in the bottom. So that's where we've gone for it. This DAF, um, you know, running gear really, which is ZF box, standard wagon clutch, which we're hoping is going to do because we're not again doing what Kevin's trying to get that horsepower and grip and slip and all that is like, you know, a hell of a thing to do. We're not just going to be as harsh as that mm. much. Um, <laughs> and then. Um, the ratios, it's got a five-speed box, which has got an overdrive of 0.75 because because of the shaft speed. We want to bring the, the you know your, your prop shaft speed up to as high as we can for your diff and all that. So at the moment, it, it's going to do geared somewhere around 125 mile an hour. Running it stand the revs. If we rev it out and see how far you go with it, it's going to go more. If we really find we're, we're brave, we can change the pinion in the diff you know, we only need to change that by a thing and it'll do 170 <laughs> mile an hour. Or, you, or if you put it like one to one, it'll do 340 mile an hour. But, you know, I don't think we're going to be here telling you about that. The problems now is the fueling's not just right, it's running a bit rich and we've got a little bit of oil burn. So that's why it's down here. We, we um, thought the easiest thing rather than Kev's time's precious, trailing up to me, he's got bits on the shelf here, chuck it in a truck, bring it down here, put it in the workshop and let's have a look at it here while we can do that, so that's where we're up to, um, and then when we ran it here last week for the first time, I've just been running it on super unleaded, which is like 95 octane from the go, that's, you know, go and get your uh, 60 quid's worth and tip it in a can and, and, and put it in, and, and, it, and it run on it, it's fine, and then when we were running it here, you said about running it on proper aviation fuel, which is what you run one of your tractors on, yeah. uh, which is, what's that, 120? No, it's 100 LL. It's, only, un, it's, not, un, it's not mega, but it's, it's, the, it's the right it's stuff. It's the yeah. right it's stuff. The, so and it's right stuff. It was, the difference was very noticeable to the point yeah. of we filled it up into its little fuel can and when it um, changed over, when it used what was in the part, like the difference in flame, noise, I was like really surprised by it. It was quite yeah. an interesting learning curve that was. Yeah. Spot on. Right, well, I'll let you guys crack on for a bit and then, uh, yeah, we'll get it fired up, see what's what. Go on. Right, Alex, before we go frapping it up, um, just to explain what, what you're showing us here. Well, this is one of the ideas that we've got why it's running too rich all right. the time, so we're going to change this on it. So this is the temperature charge metering needle. So if you can see here, this little tiny needle on the end of there is on the end of this diaphragm, and then this capillary tube runs round to a temperature probe, and that slots up an intake manifold. Right. So that's your, your incoming air from your supercharger, yeah. and then this other end fits onto a fuel pump, which is what this this is not the one off. It, to give you an idea. So it fits over there, there's a little tiny hole in the end of there, and basically, as the temperature changes of the engine, as it comes up to um, working temperature, heats this up and the needle shuts the hole off, metering the fuel to it, right. basically like pulling the choke out. It's a mechanical, it's a mechanical yeah. choke, that's right. exactly what it is. Mechanical automated choke. Yeah, basically. exactly. Right. But we think this is the problem, we've played with this before on it, but we've no avail, so we've got one, that we know is definitely working. So a simple way to test it, you can get very technical with dial indicator, but is to measure just with a vernier. If we measure off the end of there, yeah. that to the base of that, so that's 28.34 mil. And then with the heat gun, your, your hair dryer, your hair dryer, <laughs> oh, yeah. doesn't get used, it's like, brand new, that, yeah. it's like brand new, isn't you? <laughs> it's just warm that up. And what's, what's in there? And what do we think's in there? We're not sure. Not sure, right? <laughs> um, no, we don't actually. know. What do we think's in there, Josh? We, we were debating this whether it's like a mercury tube or whether it's a like a a spring, you know, that, that, that senses the temperature and just expands. No, we haven't actually found out. We've not cut well, one open to see. Cameraman but... Chris is cleverer than all of us put together. Yeah. He had a theory that it could be, could what, be what, is wax. It wax. Could be wax. Wax. So. In theory, when it's sensing that temperature change, 
that should be moving. And this will be warming up with uh, going past it. Yeah, it's like your old man on a cold day, isn't it? <laughs> Warmer up and the bigger it gets. So as this is warming up, that That's in warm. theory is just starting to now. pop out. So in theory, out. now we've right. warmed that up. What were we on? 28.32. 29.33. Right, pretty much a mil. A millimetre moving, which is what we reckoned with the one that we've just put on the engine. We've done exactly the same. Kindly, Josh has taken this off his engine, off one of his tractor pullers, so, because um, we know it obviously works, because yeah. he's running right, to prove the one mil movement, so we found another one, we've tested three or four, they lie around here everywhere and uh, come up with one that works, put it on it, and that's the, the thing to try now. So right, there you go. That's what we're doing. Right, frap it up time Frap now. it up time. Mega. See what it does. Right, we're going to have a do with it. Let's have a do, let's see what happens. We're right. Yeah, I'm going to stand we're, 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 we're keep thinking we're You're all not right. Well right. You get in there, Chris. Yeah. Right, we've got that on. So we'll prime it with oil first. So the, the running noise of the uh, buzzing is putting that engine all around it with the electric pump first to make sure it's fully lubricated right everywhere. Right up to the cams. And yeah. we'll Cam, cams are the wearing part. Bring it so. up on, we've got various gauges for main oil because it's too, it's a high and low oil pressure and you'll see there's some gauges on the front, the far end of the system just to check. So that's the one, those are your two magneto switches, so that's ignition on. Prime and then that's a fuel that squirts fuel in and then start button and who knows, yeah? Right. So that's oil going. Oil? That's oil. Right. So we're going oil. What we're aiming for? Well, as long as it's got some round it, but like, you'll get up to 100 on primer. But, yeah. So that's that. So we'll give it a little bit of fuel in the uh, titty and press start button. That's a lot That's better. actually running a lot that better. running a lot better. Why was that though? That was weird. We did a blog well, test on I'm back. Not, not, not just so sure your switches are right. 
Yeah. I'm not not saying it. It's this quality of the switch is not the wiring. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. just, just, just. You mean if you use cheap shit? It's all I had. It was all an Austin. It's only a test. It's only a test. It's only a test, ain't it? Yeah. So that but, fuel that's coming out of the box, what's crap well, with that? What's causing that? Or everything's thrown in. Like I said before, everything goes in through this one one needle here, one one injector. Yeah. Everything's got to go in that front. Um, and through that uh, Coralis there, that, that effectively is a cold start. We're not running any coolant. Uh, we think it's working. It, we know it works, but I don't think it's working right because we haven't got any coolant in. Yeah. So it's, it still thinks it's cold, so it's open a bit. You know, I bet if you did a warm start and then did it again when it's gone seated because yeah. it doesn't need it, it won't throw that out when we stop it. It's only, you only notice it when you've stopped it. Right. Lads, what have we what have we learnt? What's next steps? Cup of tea. <laughs> Cup of tea, that'll solve everything. Yeah, yeah. Um well we've made We're making slow progress. progress. I think we've had one or two, more than one little issue. Yeah. I think we've got trouble with automatic timing device at the back. Um that doesn't seem to be advancing the ignition. Um yeah. Little but, slow progress. But fuel But it wise. starts like a good one. Oh, it's starting to drink, yeah, isn't it? You know, we've, we've, uh, we've got there, we've got oil pressure. You know, Alex has done a right good job on the rebuild. It's just a little bit of fine tuning. Um, it's only a second hand fuel pump on there. You know, we may have to change that for a better one. We just don't know. But we'll sol solve, we'll try and do one little thing at once because we've done one thing today. Yeah. We've cured a lot of problems. Let, we're not trying to do three things at once and we don't know whether we've cured all the problems. So. Well, there we go. I think that's part one, sort of, in the story mm. of this engine, where it's going with your yeah. project aero car. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll call it a day for today, I think. Yeah, well, he's, and, uh, he's got to get it finished, hasn't he? Because he's, he's arranged to take Josh to church. I was going to say, he's promised something, hasn't he, Josh? He's, promised, Josh promised, he's got a big promise on that... Uh, Calm down with that. <laughs> Alex, Alex is taking Josh, dropping Josh off at the church when he gets married. Right, so it's got to be done. He said, when you get that engine done in that car, you can take me to church in that. And he thought I was a right shit kicker and I was never going to fix it. Sure. So now it's running, he's, he's looking nervous. There's going to be some sabotage jobs, isn't there, on this? It's going to take him 100 years. It's going to take him 100 years, that. Oh, well. <laughs> Mega, great, gents. Thank you very much That's for coming. That's been absolutely pleasure. spot on. We will catch up with this again. We'll catch up with you again somewhere, and we'll definitely catch up with you again somewhere, because you two, there's just, there's, there's just stuff going on all the time, isn't there? Yeah. Job is a piece. Hope you lot enjoyed that, and we will catch you again in Great. a bit.